Okay, well, here we are. We are ready for part two of lecture 10. I apologize for getting to you this, uh, getting this to you a little bit late uh, with Memorial Day this week. It threw me off and my wife also had surgery this morning on her uh, right eye. So um, she, uh, she had, um, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Uh, I didn't plan on telling you all this, uh, but I want you to know why I'm late. I'm not, I promise I'm not just hanging around doing nothing. Um, if I was, I'd be on Twitter, right? Um, no, she got about a year ago. She got the shingles virus in uh, this nerve up in her um, this this nerve that goes to your eye. And anyway, the shingles eventually went away, but the the virus just stayed on her eye. And so um, they tried to get rid of it, and tried to get rid of it, and tried to get rid of it. And uh, eventually, they just said they're going to need to remove the thing that it's on, and then replace it. So they did that this morning on her right eye, and then she goes back next week. For the left eye. So, um, if that uh, if next week I'm a little slower, that's probably why. Okay, but she's doing great. Uh, you don't have to send anything unless you want to send crumble cookies, uh, because they are they are the pavement of the celestial kingdom. All right, let's. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and let's get into John chapter nine. We're going to do John nine, ten, and eleven on this second half. Okay. Uh, John 9, one of the best stories in all of scripture. I don't know why, you know, we just don't talk about, we don't talk about New Testament stories enough, you guys, in the church. I just, I wish we talked about these as much as, I wish, you know, I wish uh, primary kids knew the story of the blind man, right, or the guy formerly known as the blind man, um, as much as they knew the story of, you know, Alma the Younger, or uh, as much as they knew the story of King Benjamin, right, because these, these are fantastic, inspiring stories. Uh, just like the ones we have in the Book of Mormon. Okay, uh, so Jesus, um, again, it, could John, remember, we started John 7 with the Feast of Tabernacles, right? Big party, lots of people in Jerusalem uh, in the fall, and uh, it never says quite when this ends. So um, I like to think that John 9 is still during the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, just because it kind of works out interestingly, um, but no one really knows. Okay, John 9, Jesus is uh, again in Jerusalem, and uh, they see this man who was uh, born blind, so he's, you know, can see nothing ever, uh, opposed to some people who it seems that they've been able to see before in some of the miracles we've talked about. And they ask him a question. They said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? All right, now this, this question is important for two reasons. One, it's important because you need to understand that the Jews, there was a belief that had crept into their society that's really not scriptural. And the belief is uh, that if there's any physical handicap in your life, it was a result of sin, right? Uh, and, and maybe that's the way they, they, they dealt with the injustice of it, right? Why did this person get born with this disability when this person didn't? Um, and so it must have been the result of sin, right? Um, so this had kind of, uh, this was something that they believed, right? And so um, they don't even ask if sin is a problem with this disability, notice. They don't say, was this because of sin? They want to know who sinned that he had this problem. Okay, so that's one of the first reasons you need to understand the question. The second important thing is um, notice that there, the, in the Bible, you'll rarely get, you'll rarely get mentions of a pre-mortal life, right? There's, they're rarely found in the Bible. The, the one you probably already know is the Jeremiah, right? Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. That is uh, pretty much the only one of a pre-mortal life. Um, not for Jesus, of course. Um, that's in John 1, you know, in the beginning was, was the Logos, but for you and I. So the question that he, could he sin that he was born blind implies that he was sinning, he could have sinned before he was born. So you want to make a note of that whenever there's a, there's a mention of a pre-mortal life, uh, and maybe not a mention of it, but a... Um, kind of implied in the question. Okay, verse three, Jesus corrects the doctrine. He's like, nobody sinned for this handicap, right? <laughs> you guys, not all problems are a result of sin. Um, and, and it creeps into the church today, right? For, uh, for many years, I think even when I was growing up, I think it was starting to change then, but it's this idea of like mental illness was a result of sin. If you're depressed, it's a result of sin. If you're, you know, and now we know, right? The, hopefully we're, we're correcting those, these false doctrines. It's not scriptural. 
um, he says, no, this is just, you know, this is the plan of God. When he says the works of God may be manifested in him, it's the idea that, that this is God's, this is God's part of his plan. Okay. Um, so he goes to the man uh, and he spits uh, and made some mud and he puts the, the mud on the guy's eyes and he says, uh, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he goes to wash. Okay. Uh, now, here's why I th hope it's during the Feast of Tabernacles, you guys. Is, remember what I told you about the Feast of Tabernacles? They've got that golden pitcher. Remember the golden pitcher? They're going to walk it down to where? The Pool of Siloam. So it, it says in my Bible video, in my head, and I should make them because they'd be way better. Um, I got the, the priest is going down. He's dipping the golden pitcher in the water. Everyone is reverent and silent. And they're just, wow, this moment. And then on the far end of the pool of Siloam comes this blind guy with mud on his eyes. And he comes like walking in and he's, you know, gets in the pool of Siloam and starts washing his eyes off. And he's just like all of a sudden screaming and yelling that he can see, right? That would just be a great moment uh, to watch this. So if it didn't happen that way, it should have. So we're going to say it did. All right, so it says he can now see. Uh, the neighbors, therefore, this is verse eight, uh, they which before had seen him that he was blind, they said, is this not the same guy that sat and begged? And uh, some said, yeah, that's him. Others said, he looks like him. But he said, it's me, right? And they said, whoa, how'd you get your eyes open? Like, how'd you get your sight? And he said, a man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And so I washed and I received sight. And they said, where is he? He said, I don't know. I've never seen him, obviously. All right, so, um, so the, this gets such news, right? Which makes me think it's during the Feast of Tabernacles because, right, still crowds around talking, uh, that the Pharisees bring him in. And they say, um, oh, of course, it was the Sabbath day, right? That they, he was, his eyes, that he was, he was healed. So the Pharisees said, um, what did he do to you? And he said, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I do see. Verse 16, then said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, Jesus, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. <laughs> Just when obedience gets in, when obedience becomes a means to itself, right? That's what you get. Um, <laughs> it's like, um, what if you, what if you were driving by your, uh, there's a person in your neighborhood that's not a member of the church, so you don't live in Utah County, um, and uh, you're driving by and you see a member of your ward on Sunday helping this, uh, this person who's not a member or even, you know, not an active in the church, whatever, and they're helping them lay sod on Sunday, right? There's two different responses to that that I've actually seen. I've seen one going, that is wrong, right? And I've seen others go, that is missionary work, right? That is good. Well, you got the Pharisees' response there, right? This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, now this is other Pharisees, listen to this phrase, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? Who do you think that is? Come on, we got to know who that is, right? John 9, 16, others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? Doesn't that sound a lot like John chapter 3? Nicodemus, when he says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest. I'm reading the whole verse without getting there. That thou doest, except God be with him. All right? Finally got there. John 3, 2. So um, that's got to be Nicodemus in verse 16. So they said to the blind man, okay, what do you think? He opened your eyes. He says, he's got to be a prophet. They did not believe concerning him. They didn't think he'd ever been blind. <laughs> They're like, no way. So they just refused to see the truth here. Um, so they call in his parents and they're like, is this your son? Yeah. Was he born blind? Yeah. How does he now see? We know not. Um, he is of age. Ask, he can speak for himself. And it says the parents don't want to say anything because they're scared of the Pharisees that they're going to kick them out of the church. So they get the blind man back again and they said, all right. Um, Okay, now, I just want to remind you of something. Who was this guy this morning? He was a man who sat and begged. He was basically the bottom of the social totem pole right there next to Samaritans, right? Um, and now what's he doing? 
he is talking to the elite of his society. Do you think his, he knew, <laughs> do you think he had any idea how that day was going to be, right? Oh, in the next 12 hours, I will be uh, talking to the Pharisees and I'll probably be seeing them, right? I mean, what a difference just a few hours can make when you're dealing with Jesus, right? And uh, they call him again and they said, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to give God the praise. We know, this is verse 24, we know, Pharisees, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. So they're, they're basically going to say, you will no longer tell people about that Jesus did this. You will give God the praise, right? And because Jesus is a sinner, you're not going to mention him. So it's kind of a, he's putting, they're putting a little pressure on him to change the story. You see that? And the man responds with, I mean, this is classic. He answers, John 9, 25. You want to mark this one. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, or no, those italics mean that they were added by the translators. Um, whether he be a sinner, I know not. One thing I know, I was blind, now I see. Okay, now break that down for a second. What's, what's he doing? Here's the essence of a testimony in one verse. There are some things I do not know. And why would he say, I don't know if Jesus is a sinner? He's just being honest. He doesn't even know him. He's never even seen him right? He's heard his voice. He's done what he said. And that's about it. Uh, he won't go out on a limb and say he's a sinner, right? He won't do what they're saying. He says, well, he's a sinner or not. I know not. I'm not going to say that he is. Um, here's what I know. So the essence of a testimony, you guys, is, is there's some things I don't know, but there are some things I know for sure, right? And you don't need to know everything to know some things for sure. Does that make sense? Uh, so this to me is fantastic. Well, I mean, this could be today, right? Where someone could write on a comment board, how can you believe in the Book of Mormon? I know Joseph Smith is a sinner. I know Brigham Young, fill in the blank. I know these people are all sinners, right? And you could even honestly write back, whether Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or anybody else is a sinner, I know not. That's okay to say. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't think they are personally. I, you know, I've studied their lives. I think they're... Uh, human beings. Um, they're not Jesus by any means, but uh, I think they're doing the best they could, just like we are. Um, but I could respond with whether Joseph Smith or Brigham Young, whoever is a sinner, I know not. Here's what I know. The Book of Mormon changed my life. What are they going to say, right? When the guy goes, here's what I know. I was blind. Now I see. No, -uh. you were never blind. Yeah, I was. Well, you can't see right now. Yep, I can. I was there the whole time, right? When I say to someone, whether Joseph Smith was a sinner or not, I know not. Here's what I know. The Book of Mormon changed my life. It's, it's my own experience, right? Um, it's the idea of I was there the whole time. I witnessed the entire change. I know what happened. Do you remember uh, Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith history says, I knew it. I knew that God knew it and I could not deny it. That seems like this guy here, right? Here's what I know for sure. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to retreat, right? I'm not going to give up that ground. I'm not going to go, well, I don't know if it was Jesus or not when I do. So they are mad. They asked him again. They said, well, how open be thine eyes? This guy was begging this morning says, I told you already and you wouldn't hear me. Do you want to hear me? Do you really want me to say it again? Would you be his disciples? <laughs> like He is totally taking these guys on. I love this guy. And they were mad at him. And they said, you're his disciple. I love that. Your mom's his disciple. Uh, we are Moses's disciples. Verse 29. We know, we know that God spake to Moses. This guy, Jesus, we don't know from whence he is. And the man totally calls him out. He goes, this herein is a, herein is a marvelous thing. You know not from whence he is, and yet he opened mine eyes. Now we know, apparently, we know that God does not hear sinners, right? According to your doctrine, God doesn't hear sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And I'm pretty sure God has not been opening a lot of people's eyes through people, right? Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. And Joseph Smith adds, except he be of God. So he kind of, he, he notices that the Pharisees have painted themselves into a corner. And he's got, guys, you got nowhere to go. This guy's healing the blind and you don't want him to be of God, but he's healing the blind. Like what do you, and they, uh, 
when someone points out the obvious, man, they get upset. They said, you were born in your sins, verse 34. They go to insults. Again, remember they did that with Jesus in the, was it the last chapter? You're a Samaritan, right? Now here's another insult. You were born in sins and you try to teach us and they kick him out. Uh, verse 35, um, Jesus says, well, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe on the son of God? Do you think he recognized that voice? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, you have now seen him. And is it he that talketh with the Lord? I believe, man, the guy formerly known as the blind guy. I love this guy. Don't you love this guy? Oh. And then Jesus starts talking to the, um, uh, the Pharisees that are close to him about uh, how you become spiritually blind when you say you don't have any sin in your life, but you know you do. Uh, man. Isn't this great? You guys, we should be teaching this story left and right. We should be talking about this. Here we have the essence of a testimony. Uh, here we have standing up for what you believe in, uh, even to those who probably terrify you, right? Um, we have uh, Jesus rewarding faith. He just kind of waits to see how this guy responds. And I, I wonder if Jesus is just sitting outside the room going, oh, ah, right? Like, <laughs> He's really killing them here. Oh, it is so good, isn't it? The man, the man born blind. You guys got to love that story. Okay, let's go. Let's move on. Let's talk John chapter 10. You know, whenever I see the Savior with, uh, in a painting with an animal, uh, almost always it's a sheep. Almost always, right? Uh, some, for some of you, it's a black sheep. Uh, but for most of you, there you are. You're just a cute little sheep. Jesus is always with sheep. It's rarely with cats, rarely with dogs, rarely with, you know, guinea pigs and stuff. Although I did find this one, which was kind of interesting right here. Um, uh, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the little T-Rex. All right. So, <laughs> sorry. It's probably, I probably shouldn't show you that. Okay. So this all comes from one chapter. The idea of the savior with uh, sheep all comes from one chapter and it's John chapter 10. So, um, he, he makes an analogy here. Some people think would call this a parable, but it's really not. It depends, I guess, how you define a parable. If you're just making a parable an analogy, uh, then, then yeah, I guess this could be a parable. But by our definition in our class, a parable is like a story that he tells. Once upon a time, there was a shepherd, right? Um, and he doesn't do that here. He just says things are like other things. He says, uh, verily I say to you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Okay, let's talk about sheepfold. A sheepfold is like a place, it's, it's kind of like a, a dog, or not a dog, a, a sheep hotel. So um, if you got, let's say um, I'm, I live in the Holy Land, I got this big piece of property and I decide to build like a, a sheep hotel. So what I do is I build a, a wall, right? A little stone wall around my area that I want. Let's say I've got a full acre and I serve five acres and I surround it with a wall. And then on top of the wall, I, build, I, I plant thorn bushes all along the top. So it's like a barbed wire fence, right? And I only have one opening in there. And then shepherds who can't obviously can't be with their sheep all day and all night, right? Can't be with them 24-7, uh, can bring them over to me. They can bring their 10, 12, 14 sheep over to me, and I will let them in. Um, now, if somebody if somebody's coming up to the sheepfold and they don't go through the door, it's pretty obvious they are a thief or a robber, right? If someone is entering a house through an open window, Mm, they probably don't live there or they're a college student who forgot their keys. But most often than not, uh, if you see someone going in a window and it's the middle of the night, right? This is what the Savior's saying. If you saw that, you'd know that they were a thief or a robber. But the person who enters into the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name. Notice that in verse three, he calls them by name. He's named each of them and he leads them out. Um, in the days of Jesus, Sorry, we'll skip that. In the days of Jesus, um, and it still happens a little bit today, not as, not as much, right? But um, you had shepherds who really, uh, these sheep were like, more like pets to them than livestock. So think of those of you who have a dog or, uh, you know, uh, dog's probably the best example. I'm trying to think of anything that will come when it's called. 
Uh, I think pigs will do that too. Maybe cats. I don't know. I'm not really a cat person. I think cats should stay where they belong in the road. But with dogs, all right, you can, I'm just kidding. If you're a cat person, don't turn it off. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Promise. Uh, you want to hear a really bad joke? Um, and you shouldn't blame me for this because John, by the way, sent this to me. He, he's like, I couldn't type this up because it's better. So he sent me an actual video. I can show you the video. Ask me on a Q&A. He sent me a video. He goes, um, Timothy, his son, just told him this joke. He said, Dad, how do, you, <laughs> how do you turn a dog? How do you turn a cat into a dog? Or how do you make a dog? <sighs> I'm killing it here. How do you make a cat sound like a dog? And he said, I don't know. And he said, you dip it in gasoline, light a match and woof. <laughs> now, you guys, that is a bad joke. That is wrong. You should never hurt an animal. I'm not joking. You should never hurt an animal because um, animals are wonderful. But okay. So anyway, uh, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, the dogs. So if you have a dog that you love and you call it over to you, you call it by name, right? We have a little dog named Bonnie. I used to have a dog named Esme. She passed away last year. just broke my heart. Um, so you just call him over, right? Bonnie, 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 right? And a well-trained dog or a dog who's known you for a long time just comes right along. Now, if you have a really well-trained dog, something interesting happens when a different person calls their name, right? If I were to go to your house and call your dog, right? I'm like, here, Cougar, here, Bosco, whatever. A well-trained dog, some dogs are just like kind of dumb, like, hey, I love you, right? If a thief came in, they'd be like, rub my belly. But a well-trained dog um, will look at you going, I know that word, but I don't know that voice. That's very similar to shepherds in Jesus's day, right? He'll, he'll call them by name and leadeth them out. So what would be fascinating is to see a shepherd walk up to a sheepfold, which is going to have a lot of sheep in it from all sorts of different shepherds. And he's going to be like, Joe, Bob, Larry, LaFonda, right? And they're going to be like, bah, bah, bah. see you guys, bah, right? They're going to go they're going to follow him out. He can like pick them out one by one by name and they're going to, they're going to come out to him. Um, he says, a stranger, verse five, they will not follow. They'll flee from him because they don't know the voice of stranger. So even if the stranger calls him by name, they're going to be like, I don't know you, right? Well, um, it says in verse six, this parable spake Jesus unto them. It's not a parable, uh, but they understood not the things which he spake unto them. So they're kind of like, they don't get it right? Uh, I think today you and I understand it because we have the benefit of all the centuries, right? And, and primary and all of that. We understand that this, the shepherd in this, in this analogy is the savior and that he loves us, right? And he knows each of us by name and he would call, call to us, right? And we'll come to him because we have a long relationship with him, right? We wouldn't go to him if we didn't know his voice, so this is the idea of, do you know the Savior's voice in your life? Can you recognize it? Um, uh, do you spend enough time together that you know when it's him, right? Um, and we'll, we'll talk, we can talk more about that a little bit later uh, in the end of John uh, when another story comes up. So I'll try to remember. Okay, so he changes the analogy a little bit here and he says, okay, um, instead, let's just say I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me in Joseph Smith test, uh, ads who testified not of me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. All right. So the idea is like, um, if he's the door, he says it again in, in verse nine, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So into a sheepfold, there's one door. There's only one way in, right? So now he's making the sheepfold kind of this idea of the, of heaven right? We would say celestial kingdom. And there's one way in. There is no other way in, right? If you're trying to get in some other way, you are not the shepherd, right? You're a thief and a robber. You're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to go around God's plan, right? Um, and the only way in is through the Savior. You know, we sometimes do this, you guys. We sometimes do this with our own obedience and our own works. We want to earn our way to heaven, some of us, right? We're saying, I'm going to be really obedient so I can go to heaven. And that's the wrong paradigm. Yes, I want you to be obedient, but I want you to be obedient because you love Jesus. Um, I'm obedient because I love Jesus, and Jesus is getting me in to the celestial kingdom. Does it, do you see the difference? I'm not obedient because I somehow think I'm going to earn my way there, 
right? Uh, the doctrine of the church is 100%. You know, you read the Book of Mormon. Since man had fallen, mankind had fallen, he could merit nothing of himself. He couldn't merit anything of himself. There's nothing that I do that gets me closer to heaven, right? Because I live uh, as a result of the fall. I'm living in the fall. The only thing that can save me from the fall is Jesus. So why be obedient? If obedience doesn't get me to heaven, why be obedient? Because I love him. He's providing my way uh, to, uh, to heaven. And I want to, be, um, I want to be someone who wants to be with him. Does that make sense? Like sin could change me to the point where I don't want it anymore. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want sin to change my desires. So I am trying to become like him. So I'll want to be around him. Um, all right. Uh, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might find it more abundantly. I get it. Uh, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is the hireling, so the guy who's part-time, he is not the shepherd, who sees, whose own the sheep are not. When he sees the wolf coming, He'll leave the sheep and run, and the wolf will catch them and scatter the sheep and kill some, obviously. And the hiring will flee because he's a hireling and he cares not for the sheep. Um, and he says he'll lay down his life for the sheep in verse 15. Now, you guys, this would this this is a little this is taking the analogy pretty far. Um, now, I I I don't want to sound I don't want to sound mean here. But if the house is burning down and my dog's inside, I'm not going in. I, uh, I know some of you are like, Brother Smith, that's terrible. I know, but it's a dog, right? I mean, uh, I mean I'll feel bad, but I can get another one. And I want to be around to see my kids, you know, graduate and get married and have grandkids. And I'm not going to get, I'm not going to throw that all away for a dog. I, I some of you are like, you're the worst. I, that's, I, I, but you, you, I, deep down, you get what I mean, right? The, it, here's what I mean. The shepherd's life is much more valuable than a sheep's life. You can get a new sheep, right? You don't get a new shepherd, right? You just don't be like, oh, we'll just replace him. The sheep wouldn't know what to do right? If I died, my kids aren't going to be like, oh, that's okay. He gave his life for the dog. No, right? I mean, it, it's one is more valuable than the other. A human life is more valuable than an animal life. So when the Savior says he's going to give his life for his sheep, that would be almost a little confusing, right? If someone said to you, I love this dog so much, I would die for it. You're like, ooh, really? Now, why? I think this is part of what we're supposed to see here is that it is the atonement of Jesus Christ is, is not even. He's not, we're not trading a good life for a good life, right? Like he's giving up his good life so you and I can have ours. This is a God. He is a God who is sacrificing something. He, he shouldn't have to sacrifice for things that are not as valuable as he is. I know some of you are like, Brother Smith, I don't like this. I don't like you saying that I'm not valuable. You are valuable. You are absolutely valuable, right? Uh, but, but you're more expendable than Jesus. And so am I. So do you see, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is not, when we see these verses about the shepherd giving his life for his sheep, not just going, oh yeah, that's good. You should go, no, that's, that's, that's not that's not right. That shouldn't, he shouldn't do that, right? So what would that tell you about this shepherd? That his love for his sheep governs all of his decisions. It is his love for these sheep uh, is more than his love for himself, right? His humility, his goodness, his love is, is overpowering. I'm not talking about the shepherd and I'm not talking about the sheep. I'm talking about me and you and Jesus. He loves us in a way that is outside of our understanding because you and I would not give our lives for these animals. Just in the same way, he says, I would, I would give my life for these humans, right? These, these mortals, these human beings. And he's a God. All right. Well, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, bring it up in the Q&A. I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be mad at me, especially you cat people. Don't be mad at me if you're a cat person. It's okay to be a cat person. It's all right. I'm not going to say all the things that are going through my head 
right now. Okay. Um, verse 16, he mentions uh, that there are other sheep, which I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. They shall hear my voice. There will be one fold and one shepherd. That is a direct connection to the Book of Mormon. We'll come back to the wolf. I forgot about that. Uh, but in Third Nephi, the Savior says to the Nephites, the people in the Americas at the temple there, of, uh, of that ye are they of whom I said, and he quotes John, uh, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. All right, so I, I want you to remember that direct connection to the Book of Mormon. I'm sure many of you have already heard it before. It's a way better connection than the Ezekiel 37 connection, the stick of Judah and Ephraim, although that is a good connection. And if you have a question on that, I can explain that to you. This is a better one. This is a better direct connection. All right. I, I want to mention the wolf really quick, which I forgot in verse 12. Uh, the hireling sees the wolf coming and he's out of there. And wouldn't you be? I mean, come on, look at this, right? If I've been paid nine bucks an hour to watch some sheep and this thing's coming at me, I'm like, have at it, you know? lamb chops for you. I'm out of here. Um, why? Because uh, I'm not so interested in the sheep. I mean, think about it. If you're working at Taco Bell and some guy comes up with a gun and says, give me all the soft, you know, the soft tacos, you're going to be like, through my dead body. No, you're going to be like, go ahead, right? I make nine bucks an hour. So have at it, right? Have all the soft tacos you want. Uh, I'm going home. So uh, w w does that tell you more about the shepherd? right? That the shepherd would, would be willing to stand between the wolf and his sheep. I, oh, and the sheep's not good. I mean, the sheep's, the sheep's dead without the shepherd, right? Like <laughs> if you're a sheep and you see this coming at you, what are you going to be like, man, no, you're, you're going to be, your legs are going to be ripped off in like two seconds, right? Now, some people have said that they think that the wolf here represents Satan. And I just don't think so. Um, because Satan does not kill the Lord, right? He has really nothing to do with it. Um, it's, it's the Lord giving up his own life um, for the law of justice. So I would say the wolf represents the law of justice. And what is the law of justice as described in the Book of Mormon? You probably know it, right? Which is no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God and every sin right? Must be punished. This is all Second Nephi chapter 9. Um, here comes the awful monster death and sin, right? So here, here they come. And I've, as a sheep, I've got no chance. This is me against the law of justice. I'm the sheep and the law of justice is the wolf and I've got no chance. I mean, zero. The probability is zero. I've got no chance of winning this fight. What do I need? I need someone who's willing to step between me and the law of justice. And the law of justice will not stop until it is fully paid, right? Um, and it doesn't have to. It's a law. So when, when the Lord, please don't ever think that when you repent of a sin, that doesn't mean you're, there's no punishment. It means there's no punishment for you. But the punishment, according to the law of justice, must still be paid by someone. So I hope that that, to me, remembering that helps me not think, oh, I can sin and repent, right? Like I can sin and repent um, because that, that means I'm, uh, what would Paul say? Do you remember this phrase from Paul? Uh, I crucify Christ afresh, meaning why would you do that? Why would you willingly give someone a punishment on your behalf that you could, you know, that you could avoid if you could, right? So for me, this idea that the law of justice is coming and that I set it free by my own sins and he's willing to step between me and the law of justice every time for every single sin makes me at least not want to sin. I'm still going to, I'm still going to make stupid mistakes, but I don't want to. Um, and I'm going to try to avoid it as much as I can because I love my shepherd. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's keep going here. I don't want to go too far over my time. So let's go to John chapter 11. You'll remember the story of Zacchaeus from the gospel of Luke, right? All right. Well, this, this plays into the story uh, in John chapter 11. So it says that the Savior uh, was on his way to Jerusalem when he hears that Lazarus is sick. And where does Lazarus live? 
He lives in Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem. So Jesus is on his way there. This is perfect. Someone sent word like, hey, you got to hurry. Lazarus is really sick. It seems that whenever the Savior goes to Jerusalem, he stays in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, a group of siblings. And they live in Bethany, like I said, and it's just about four miles from Jerusalem. Today, it's just a part of Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem's grown. It's gotten really big. So at that time, these were separate cities. And uh, you would you would walk the road from Bethany to Jerusalem. He would walk the road with his disciples, with the apostles, and probably others every day. He would walk all the way to the temple, four miles. So you've got a good you know hour and a half to talk. And then at night, when everything's wrapped up, you walk back to Bethany, and you've got another hour and a half to talk. So he's going to do a lot of his teaching on this road. And this is whenever he goes to Jerusalem for a feast right? And you can probably name the three feasts he probably goes for. He's going to go there for which one in the beginning, uh, in this, the first one is going to be Passover. The second one's going to be 50 days later on Pentecost, right? Feast of weeks. And then the last one's going to be in the fall for tabernacles. Those are the three feasts that Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem for. Well, uh, this one is in the spring. Uh, he's heading there for Passover and they, they kind of send word like, please hurry up. Uh, but then in verse six, it says, when he heard thereof that he was sick, he abode two days in the same place where he was. And this is likely where he was. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? And he says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, right? And Zacchaeus fell out of the tree. He's like, uh, today I'll stay at your house. That, this, that, these two stories seem to line up really well where this is where Jesus was. He was staying at the house of a publican. Right. And finally, the apostles are saying, are we going to go to Jerusalem? And one of them, a couple of them say, let's not go because they're going to try to kill you. In verse 8, Master, the Jews of late have sought to stone thee, and you're going to go back again? Um, and they said, uh, verse, he says in verse 11, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that may awake him out of sleep. Verse 12, Lord, if he's asleep, he'll do well. So they understood the idea that if, oh, is he sleeping, he's probably going to get better, right? Um, but Jesus spake of his death. He turns to him and says, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> Is okay. I'm laughing here, guys, because I know what happens, but man, that'd be a shocking moment, right? <laughs> Think about your roommate situation, right? You're like, hey, should we head back to Provo? Um, I heard Jessica wasn't feeling well. Yeah, let's go back there. She's uh, I heard she's asleep. Oh, well, good. If she's sleeping, let's not go and let's not go bother her. No, she's dead, right? You're like, <laughs> what? Um, and he says, but I'm gonna go. I'm going to go now. And Thomas, verse 16, Thomas, one of the apostles, says, let's go that we may die with him. Um, to me, Thomas, this is Thomas's great moment here. Let's go that we can die with him. He's willing to die with Jesus uh, in front of these, you know, at the hands of these Pharisees. Um, now, when you hear about Thomas the apostle, what do most people think of? Most people um, would think of a, the name Doubting Thomas, right? Because he's going to, in the resurrection, the apostles, all the other 10 apostles are going to say, we saw him, and he's going to say, I won't believe until I see it myself. And so we call him Doubting Thomas. How come no one calls him Die With Him, Die With Him Thomas? Right? We've got two moments with Thomas in the scriptures, basically. One is a low moment, a doubting moment. One is a high moment, a die with him moment. And the one that he's known for is his lowest moment. Now, I, I get it, right? We, we like people to be human. We like to know that they have weaknesses like us. But will you do me a favor? Will you try to be someone who talks about people's highest moments, who talks about people's greatest strengths? And it will be awkward for you sometimes because someone's going to be gossiping about someone, right? They're going to be like, did you hear about so-and-so and so-and-so? And so? I can't believe it. I, I, right? I heard they were up on Squaw Peak or whatever. And you're going to be like, you know what? Uh, I, he, was, he gave a lesson in my elders' corner once. It was fantastic. <laughs> and that's all you're going to say. They'll be like, oh. Okay. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be like, repent, swine. No, you don't have to do that. You can just say good things about people. Um, it's fascinating to me when, when we have this great moment for Thomas and no one ever mentions it. All right. Uh, so when he gets finally to Bethany, 
uh, it says that Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Um, he had been in the, in the tomb for four days. All right. This is kind of an, an interesting story because when he gets there, um, oh, there's Doubting Thomas, right? We have, um, I should have moved that forward. All right. So the Savior gets there and um, Martha goes out to meet him. And she does not sound happy when she says in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, to me, that sounds like she is upset. Um, some people have said, well, I don't know if she's upset. She might be bearing her testimony. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother, he wouldn't have died. But I don't know. If you're a completely unemotional person, then maybe you read it that way. But for me, she's got to be upset, right? Because the idea is how many people have they heard about him healing and helping? You healed Peter's mother-in-law, you've healed strangers, you've healed Samaritans, you've healed Romans. We're family friends, right? Jesus says, thy brother shall rise again. Martha says, I know he will rise again at the resurrection. Um, he calls for Mary and Mary comes out and she says the exact same thing. Lord, if thou been here, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. And um, so it sounds like Mary and Martha have been talking. Uh, and Jesus saw her weeping in verse 33. He saw the friends around weeping and he was groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Um, and he says, where have you laid him? And they said, come over and see, like he wants to go over and at least see the, the burial site, right? In verse 35, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in scripture, Jesus wept. But it's, a, it's an important verse. Um, I know my, my, when I was a seminary teacher, I, I hated this verse because it would always be some ninth grade boy who's like, Brother Smith, can I do the lesson today? Can I do the scripture today? And be like, sure. He'd get up there. The scripture for today is John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. I'd be like, his buddy's in the back. <laughs> I'm like, oh, good grief. Um, but I would always, when I got up to be a smarter teacher, I said, hey, what are you doing? Get back up there. And they're like, what? I'm like, get back up there. John eleven thirty five. 35. Good job. You memorized that. Um, now I want you to answer a question, a question for me. Why is Jesus weeping? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, look it up, genius. Why is he weeping? So they'd look it up. And they'd find out that Lazarus died. So they're like, he's, he's crying because Lazarus died. I'm like, Who's Lazarus? They're like, I don't know. Uh, and I'm like, well, why would Jesus be mad that he was dead? Um, I don't know, right? He was his friend, I guess. And I'm like, well, what, what's he about to do? Does anybody here in the class know what he's about to do? So, you know, one person, two people are like, he's going to bring him back from the dead. I'm like, does that make a lot of sense? Jesus is crying three minutes before he brings someone back from the dead. He's crying over their death. And the kids usually like, no, can I sit down? I'm like, yes, go sit down. Um, and then I would ask the class, why? Why is he weeping? He knows he's going to see him. Why is he weeping? And it usually was a senior, right? If it wasn't for seniors, I would have, I would have quit that job a long time ago, but, um, I guess I did. I'm at BYU now, but it was usually a senior uh, who said something like, I think he is weeping because, not because he's not going to see him again, but because he is, he, he sees other people crying and, and he feels what other people feel. And I think this John eleven thirty five, 35, you guys, is a, is a place where you and I can, can see his character and that he, he, um, He's an empathizer. He, um, he could fix our problems, and he probably will fix our problems, but for a while, he just cries with someone. And there's a, there's, a, there's a validating feeling there when someone doesn't try to fix it, doesn't try to correct it, doesn't try to correct your feelings about it. He just, someone just needs someone to cry with. If you're married, uh, this is a wonderful skill. That you don't try to, you know, fix your spouse's problems, or you don't try to, uh, you don't try to fix their way of thinking. That you, you know, you just, you just mourn with those that mourn, 
right? Remember, the covenant isn't cheer up those that mourn, right? The Lord doesn't say, and thou will cheer up those that mourn. Um, it says mourn with those that mourn. There's a difference. Uh, so he mourns with them. And then he says, uh, he says a, a prayer. He says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Well, he says, take this stone away from the gravesite. And Martha's like, no, 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 no. It, that's not going to be pleasant, right? These guys understand the idea that after four days, the body is decaying. In fact, Elder McConkie wrote this. The Jews entertain the common belief that, uh, sorry, I got to move my the box where my head is. Uh, the Jews entertain the common belief that the spirit of the deceased lingered around the body for three days, hoping to enter it once again. After that, decay began to set in and the spirit departed forever. So if you are um, uh, on day four, you guys, uh, if, you're, if you're ever around a dead body, I, I haven't been, so I, I just had to read up on this. Uh, days one, two, and three, not so bad, right? Body looks pretty much the same. Um, but you know, as the, the, there's fluids that kind of drain out of it with gravity and stuff, but, but pretty much looks the same day four, boom, that's where, um, things go, things turn, right? Uh, they go, they go smelly and bad and gross and this body is starting to decay. Well, to the Jews of Jesus's day, that was a sign that the spirit of the person had left, had gone on. So while the body was laying there kind of in a preserved state for three days, they saw that as a sign that the spirit was still there. So this could be a reason he waited four days and why John makes a, a, a very, uh, makes a point to say he had been in the grave for four days, uh, being like it had been longer than anyone thought possible. Uh, maybe Jesus brings him back after two days and, um, you know, everyone's like, well, he was going to do that anyway. The spirit was still around the body and it's much easier to bring someone back from the dead. The, the whole thing's quite silly, but... This could be a definite reason Jesus was leaving no doubt as to, um, as to his power to do anything, to do the impossible. Um, and he, he calls him out. He thanks God again. You know, there's always this thankfulness before miracles. And he cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Uh, now, that's a shocking moment. I mean, you guys, we've read this story forever, so it doesn't really get to us, but just imagine it. You saw this guy die. He, you saw his body. It's been in there for a half a week, right? It's been four days. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't, you know, been up to drink anything. He's, he, no one's heard any noises coming out of the tomb. This guy's dead, brain dead, heart dead. He is dead, and Jesus just brought him back. Um, can you imagine sitting next to Lazarus at dinner that night? You're like, you just stare. You like, probably look at you, what? You're like, you were dead. Yeah. Wouldn't you be, wouldn't you want, what was it like? What'd you do? What happened? Right? He's like, well, I was having dinner with Abraham. No, that was a parable. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's finish. I want to tell you a, a story to, to finish this. You know, this idea that uh, the spirit was hanging around the body is pretty silly, right? You and I think about that and go, that is very um, archaic, right? We're like, that's a, that's, a, that's a way of just not understanding science, right? And so you're getting around it somehow. But do we have similar beliefs that are, I don't know, think about this. Maybe this won't work. I don't know. But do we ever think that as if someone leaves the church or loses their testimony, that they've got a certain um, window of time that they could come back? Right? That, you know, we kind of work really hard to get them back. Um, we have conversations and we're trying to really hard to get them back. But after a certain amount of time, we kind of give up because we're like, no. It's over, right? They're, they've gone too far or they're too far out there. Do you have anybody in your life that you, if I were to say, do you think they'll come back? You'd be like, not a chance, right? Not a, not a chance. Because um, I wonder if we don't look sometimes like this Jewish tradition to the Lord sometimes because we're like, oh yeah, within you know, a certain amount of time, yeah, they could come back. Uh, but once they get that far enough away, whatever it be, four years 
40 years. I don't care. Um, yeah, that's, they're too far gone, right? It's impossible. I won't see them till the next life come back to the gospel. Uh, and, and then the Lord, I wonder if just waits for us, uh, waits for the window of time to get far enough away to where we're going to realize it was him that brought them back and not us or not themselves. So he's like, I'll just wait. Uh, I'll give you an example. My sister, uh, she left the church and the gospel when she was uh, 19, 19, 18. She graduated from high school, um, had a really bad experience with a uh, missionary um, and uh, left. And that was it. Uh, she then started living a kind of uh, a life I would not recommend uh, to anyone. Uh, lots of alcohol, lots of uh, lots of cigarettes, uh, lots of sleeping around. And, um, uh, and I, you know, I was young at the time this all happened. She's my older sister. So I, I you know, we remained friends. Um, uh, when I got a little bit older and started going on a, started getting, preparing for a mission, you know, she was like, well, you know, what's the big deal about baptism and stuff? You know, I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but we stayed friends all the way through. Uh, she came to my uh, she came to my wedding reception. You know, she wasn't in the temple. Um, but she came to my wedding reception. Um, uh, I went out and saw her out in Florida. She moved out to Florida with uh, one of these guys. You know, the couple of guys she you know had a new guy every couple of years. Um, and she, uh, it was fifteen. It was almost uh, 25, 26 years later um, that uh, one day, uh, and I had not put any pressure on her for a long time, right? Occasionally she'd ask me questions and I was pretty open and my other sister uh, pretty open about, you know, the blessings we feel like we have, but we're, we don't put any pressure on her. Um, and one day she sent me, a, I remember I woke up on a Sunday morning and um, I looked at my phone, right? I uh, turned off my alarm, looked at my phone, see if I got like a text or something. And that morning, early that morning oh, in Florida, so she's two hours ahead of me, she uh, texted me a picture and she said, I just thought you should know this happened yesterday. And it was a picture of her in white um, getting rebaptized with and two missionaries next to her. And I, I was like, what? You know, I had no idea she was even going to church. I had no idea she was taking the lessons. I, I was just had no idea. I had no idea. She had not shared that with anybody. Uh, and my whole family was pretty shocked to see it. Um, and I, at first I was mad, right? I was like, I would have flown out there. I would have been there for that. Why didn't you tell me? I could have helped you through it. And she said, and I understood afterwards. She said, I just didn't want to make a big, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it, right? Like I was some sort of hero. Uh, and I said, yeah, I, you know, I, I get that. I'm still mad, but I get that. Um, and she came back and still to this day, you know, that was a couple of years ago, still to this day, when I see her and she talks about church or she talks about general conference, I still just kind of look over like you were dead. <laughs> like you were, I never thought you would come back. I never, I mean, it's, it's honestly like seeing someone come back from the dead. I just never in my in my life thought she would ever come back. And I wonder if the Lord was like, yeah, I was waiting for you to get to the point where you're like, yeah, it's too far now. Now I can bring her back. Right. So let's not be that way. Let's always remember that the, you know, kind of be like Martha, you know, I wish this wouldn't have happened, but I know that whatever you ask of God can happen. Right. She does kind of bear her testimony there. Um, anyway, Sorry, it's probably went a little long. Thanks, you guys. Uh, let's um, let's uh, let's be done. I will um, see you at the Q and A next week. Remember, there's an exam this weekend. Uh, should open uh, Friday morning. That would be May 29th. It'll stay open until Tuesday. That would be June 2nd, I think, until midnight. Um, uh, and you're welcome to come to one or both of the. Uh, oh, well, you're not welcome to. You need to come to one of the Q&As. You're welcome to come to both uh, next week. Uh, bring some questions with you, please. When you run into questions, please bring them with you to the Q&A and know that your um, New Testament teacher just thinks the very thinks the world of you. And I would love to get to know you better. So if there's anything you want to do, like, hey, shoot me an email, just say, Brother Smith, this is me. This is my life. Uh, or at least when we get back on campus, please come over and see me so I can, you know, you're, you're, I, I think of my students as kind of a little part of me. And so I want to see you and 
uh, and just, you know, become, just become acquainted. All right, you guys, uh, see you soon.